Hello and welcome. You're watching Lockdown TV, the news and discussion program from unheard.com. In recent weeks, we have been talking to a lot of epidemiologists and scientists trying to understand one big question. Is the coronavirus pandemic a very deadly disease that has only passed through a small fraction of our populations and we need to reorganize our whole societies around protecting from in the future? Or is it a much milder disease that has passed through big chunks of the population and may have done as much damage as it's going to already in sections of those populations? This is the question. And in a sense, the author of that first view is Professor Neil Ferguson. We spoke to him um, about his Imperial College study. The figurehead of this other view uh, is Professor Sunetra Gupta from the University of Oxford. And I'm delighted that she joins us down the line right now. Hi, Professor Gupta. Hello. So it was March the 16th that Neil Ferguson came out with his earth shattering model that defined government responses to this pandemic. Around about a week later, your group out of Oxford University published a very different model uh, that speculated as much as 50% of the population may have been exposed to the virus already, uh, and that the infection fatality rate may be as low as 0.1%. This caused a big news story and people sort of started lining up, either they were University of Oxford people or Imperial College people on this big question of the day. We haven't heard much from you since then, um, but we have learned some new evidence since March. So what is now your view about which of these two polls the truth is likely to be closer to? So the purpose of the exercise that we published in March was to show that from the available data on deaths, we couldn't really tell just how lethal this disease was. So if you use a very simple model, an SIR model, simple compartmental model that divides the population to those who are susceptible, those who are infected, those who are recovered, and try and fit um, that to the available data, there are actually a range of scenarios that are compatible with the available data on the rise in deaths. I'm just referring to the rise in deaths because I think those are the only data one can use. The rise in cases is completely contingent on how much testing there's done. So I don't believe that's a good source of data to fit the model to, any model to. So if you, if you take the deaths and you try and fit the SIR model to it, you can get one scenario, which is essentially at the kernel of the imperial model, which is a scenario in which the infection has only just arrived and is killing lots of people or, and is going to kill even more. And the other scenario, which is equally compatible, is one where the pathogen does not have a very high risk of death upon infection and arrived approximately a month earlier and has already spread through the population. So these are two extremes, and they are both compatible with the data, as well as anything in between. So what? So that was, as you say, sort of end of March. Um, from what we've seen since, both in the UK with the way that the, the deaths are gradually uh, reducing, um, but also from serological studies we've seen in other countries, um, do you have a kind of updated estimate of, of, of where you, which, to which of those two poles you think the truth is closer to? So we're only just starting to see some reports using um, methods that are validated, often sort of in-house um, antibody tests. And they vary widely. I've just been looking at a study from Birmingham, which... Um, of healthcare workers, which says the overall rate of seroconversion is 24.4%, uh, um, and particularly high in um, people who are working in housekeeping or acute medicine, up to 34, 33%. Um, so that's on the high end of the things I've seen. And then I've seen um, measures that are much more modest than that. But the problem is that unless you have a very good statistical framework in place to make an inference from these observations, what that means to the general population, it's a bit difficult to um, conclusively say um, 
determine what what the seroprevalence is. Mm. Furthermore, some people may actually be resistant to infection. So to actually get a handle on total exposure might be harder than we think. That said, I believe my own personal view is that the on while the jury is still out, I would say that it's more, more likely that the pathogen arrived earlier than we think it did, that it had already substantially spread through the population by the time lockdown was put in place. So um, will these, when these seroprevalence numbers come out, we were expecting them last week, we may get them imminently or next week from the first wave of the ONS Oxford um, ongoing study, will that settle the argument? I mean, if it shows, let's say, 10% for the population and nearer 20% for London, just to pick a random number, will that be a case of our... Uh, Professor Gupta was wrong, and it was less than that, but it was maybe a bit more than Professor Ferguson thought, or, or, or is there grounds for ongoing discussion? I think there are grounds for um, ongoing discussion because, as I said, some people may not actually produce these antibodies we certainly know of cases, um, you know, or people who've tested positive who don't evince um, an antibody response or one that's detectable. And there are various reasons for this. One is that if we're lucky enough, we may be able to deal with the virus at a more um, basic, sort of fundamental level with our innate immune responses. Um, we may also be able to fend off the virus with pre-existing responses against other coronaviruses, uh, which I think has, is very likely to play a role in protection, particularly against severity of disease and death. So it, while the antibody tests give us an indication of how many people have been exposed, they may not tell the whole story. And so the, the, the number that comes out of an antibody test, in your view, is this kind of low bound of, of the percentage who are likely to have been exposed, and the truth lies somewhere upwards of that. That's a very good way of putting it. So does that mean that when, when we've got the, this study from Spain that I'm sure you've seen that talks about under 5% of the total population showing antibodies, and they had a really quite bad death uh, total. And that's really frightened everyone because they think, well, if only 5% have had it and they've had 30,000 people dying, then, you know, what would happen if you let the disease spread? W you would approach that result with, with more caution or how should we interpret a result like that? I think one has to be aware that a lot of these um, antibody tests are extremely unreliable. So, and also, as I said, if the studies are done in a particular group that may have been less exposed than others, um, one really has to be quite careful about interpreting uh, results. But whether they're low or high, you may also you know, chance upon a group that has, for whatever reason, been heavily exposed. So I think um, what we need to do is be patient, which is difficult given the costs of lockdown. Um, we need to be patient and analyse these all the results we get um, using a proper statistical framework that will give us a, a better indication of what this lower bound is. So does that mean that you stand by your earlier model and still think Professor Ferguson's model was wrong? So with the data that were available up to the time of lockdown in this country on deaths, either the model where it had already um, arrived and swept through and not killed too many people, or the one Neil Ferguson's model where it had arrived only quite recently yeah. and was set to kill a lot of people. Both were compatible with that, those, that particular rise in deaths. So his was the worst case scenario, which still remains compatible with the rise in deaths up to that point. And then from that point onwards, what happened would either have to be a result of lockdown, if his model is correct, mm. or if it is still compatible, what happened after lockdown, with the model where the infection fatality rate is low. I think, um, and you are, this is partly in part an answer to the earlier question you asked, what do we know now that we didn't at the end of March? So in 
almost every context, we've seen the epidemic grow, turn around and die away, almost like clockwork. And various countries have had different, different countries have had different lockdown policies. And yet what we've observed is almost a uniform kind of pattern of behavior, which is highly consistent with the SIR model. To me, that suggests that much of the driving force here was due to the buildup of immunity. So I think that's a more parsimonious explanation than one which um, requires in every country for lockdown or varying degrees of lockdown, including no lockdown, to have had the same effect. So, so, the, so those kind of immunities, so that would then be... In other words, I guess in different populations, there might be different degrees of underlying immunity, or, or would it be that, that you talked about these immunities to similar but slightly different coronaviruses, or is it that there would be basically a big chunk of the population that was never vulnerable to this virus because it had some sort of other kind of immunity that might not show up in an antibody test? So yes, that would be one factor. So there are two factors here. One is um, resistance to infection at all, or uh, certainly the untoward effects of infection, um, which could accrue either from some genetic factor that stops um, you from being infectable, um, or from previous exposure to related um, pathogens, which creates some kind of barrier to infection or to disease or death, um, the three things being different. Um, but there's also the issue of the vulnerable fraction of the population varying um, between population uh, between different settings. So uh, a very simple one is just the demographics. So the age structure in this country is very different from the age structure in South Africa. Mm. So. On just on the basis of what we know now about the dependence of mortality on age and the age structures of different populations, we can expect the burden of deaths to be very different. So how can we get to the bottom of this? Then It, it, it feels no exaggeration to say that it's the most important question in the world right now, because if you're right, and in a lot of these countries, the epidemic has passed through and we're actually the other side of it, these sort of ongoing, enormously destructive lockdown policies are a waste and they're a self-inflicted wound in many places. So how can, if, if we get serological numbers and now we're still not sure whether they represent the true levels of immunity, what steps can we do to actually get a definitive answer? That's a very good question. I think, first of all, we do need to actually do the serological surveys. They, they're only just taking off they need to be done properly and they need, we need to have a representative section of the population um, and we need, we need to get those numbers. Um, that's the starting point. Um, as you say, it's a little bit um, worrying that that may still not give us the true picture. Mm -hmm. um, but then we, need, we also need to rely on other indicators. So first of all, the structure of um, deaths. So who is actually vulnerable? Mm. And we do have more information on that now than we had in March. And it's clearer and clearer that the burden of deaths is unfortunately being borne by the elderly and those who have comorbidities or other predisposing conditions. Um, that has certain implications for infection fatality rate just how nasty this virus is. Um, so we need to pay attention to that. And then it also has implications for how to protect the vulnerable and how, how to move out of lockdown in a way that protects those who are vulnerable to COVID, but also protects those who are vulnerable to lockdown. Mm. So um, you mentioned the infected fatality rate there. Do you have a kind of estimate of what you think that currently what we should be expecting that to be? I think that the epidemic has largely come and is on its way out um, 
in this country. So I, I think it would be less, definitely less than one in a thousand and probably closer to one in 10,000. So that would be 0.01%. Yes, well, probably not 0.01, but 0.05. Uh, right. Um, so if we're talking about like policy now, we've still got this huge sort of area of uncertainty. Um, clearly, when people talk about the science, scientists, as you're demonstrating now, disagree. So what is a, what is a responsible government approach look like? I mean, they will say we, we should err on the most cautious, on the most conservative side and kind of be most cautious about coming out of lockdown. What do you think the approach should be as we go forward? Well, exactly. So the government's defence even now is that this was the, a plausible worst case scenario. I agree it was a plausible or a possible at least worst case scenario. The question is, do we or should we act on a possible worst case scenario, given the costs of lockdown? And it seems to me that um, given that the costs of lockdown are mounting, that that case is becoming more and more fragile. So what would that mean for policy next week or in two weeks time? Or you know, Does that mean a, a more rapid exit from lockdown? Is that what that means practically? Yes, I think I'd, I would have to say it means a more rapid exit from lockdown based perhaps more on certain heuristics, like who is dying, what's happening to the death rates. And even though we, we cannot prove, I mean, it's true, scientifically, it's difficult for me to say I now have proof that the epidemic um, is largely on its way out and many of us are likely immune, um, especially if not all of us are going to show um, the correct sort of, um, you know, if, if that signature isn't going to be present mm. in everybody. Um, but we, we can see who has died from the epidemic. We can see what's happened in a number of countries. As I said, they've shown this sort of clockwork behavior that mimics the SIR very nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can take together these pieces of evidence and, and, and I think one can come up with a strategy that um, takes us out of this situation when balancing those pieces of evidence against the uh, enormous costs of lockdown. So that what is it? specifically, for example, the, the focus on the R rate. I'd like, love to get your views on that, because that seems to be what the government is sort of looking at in order to decide whether to put the brakes back on or whether to come out faster and so on. It's not only deaths they're looking at. They, they're trying to model the R rate as they go. Do you think that's a mistake or is that the right way to, to measure things? Um... The R rate is principally dependent on how many people are immune. So the reason we talk about an R naught for a pathogen is because that's its maximum transmission potential. And that maximum transmission potential can only be realized in a population that is completely susceptible. So once it starts to uh, spread through a population, its R declines from its maximum potential of R naught. And the reason it does is because it's using up its resources, it's using up the susceptibles. And those susceptibles are becoming immune, at least temporarily. Um, so I don't think you can calculate R in the absence of a knowledge of how many people are immune. Um, you can construct an expression for R uh, I, I imagine it would be extremely difficult to come to a, a sensible assessment of what that number would be just from measuring the elements within that expression. So in other words, there's, there's a danger then that we're looking, we're, we're, we're modelling R wrong as we go. So we could be 
putting the brakes on and really coming out of lockdown incredibly slowly, uh, while well, mistakenly modelling R, when in fact, if we just looked at, at deaths as the only kind of reliable source of data, or maybe hospitalizations and deaths, you think that would be a more certain way to, to decide the speed of coming out of lockdown? I think so. I think measuring, I mean, cases you can't rely on at all because it's so completely dependent on the extent uh, to which the testing is done. So, I mean, I, I don't understand how cases, how there has been any kind of emphasis on cases at all. I, I don't think data on cases should be presented um, at all in the, in the, should enter into this discussion. So there's another uh, question that has popped into my head that I have just got the numbers for, um, which is, I know that when people speculate about very low infection fatality rates, a lot of people come back with New York City as the counter point there. And they say, well, more than 15,000 people have died um, of COVID in New York City of a population of around about 8 million, um, which makes it not point, more than 0.1% of the population has perished. Um, what do we make of that? It, it, how, do, how can you match that with these very low projected IFRs? I suppose, um, and, and I say this with some trepidation, but I suppose one would have to look at the um, population structure to see what fraction of New York City constitutes uh, the vulnerable fraction. Um, I mean, I'm not saying this as a way of getting out of mm. an idea, the, um, the assertion that the overall infection fatality rate is low, but one must remember that overall infection fatality rate is a linear combination of the, a very high fatality rate in a vulnerable class and a very low one in those who are not vulnerable. Mm. So one can justify or explain higher rates in a set population by um, saying that the fraction vulnerable might be higher. The extreme example of which is the Diamond Princess cruise liner from which mm. the original kind of infection fatality rates were um, obtained. It also seems like um, when there are kind of particularly bad, um, high dosage um, um, flare ups in places like hospitals, that might make a difference. Is that something we should think about? Viral load being a kind of factor? Certainly that's something I did think about when um, some healthcare workers were sort of shown to be affected who might not didn't seem to be part of the traditionally vulnerable classes that maybe the um, actual infection load was higher in those people. Um, that's possible. It's also possible that, you know, when you have pockets of vulnerable people, it might rip through those pockets in a way that it wouldn't if the vulnerable people were more sort of scattered within the general population so that their risk of exposure was not so high as being if they were sequestered with other vulnerable people. So there are um, elements, there's so differences in population structure, which along with the sort of innate resistance and innate vulnerability can also make a difference to the outcome. So you can have a really high risk group, which is perhaps somewhat isolated and then nothing happens to them and then suddenly it hits them and everyone dies. Mm -hmm. um, well, everyone is an exaggeration, but you know what I'm thinking of. So do you think- uh, um, Care homes. Form. Yeah, I was gonna say that it raises the um, really sort of worrying prospect that we might actually have made things worse um, in Western countries like the UK by reacting as strongly as we did. And, you know, one, the obvious example is that we essentially cleared out the hospitals in expectation of this huge wave of incoming patients and ended up accidentally seeding infections in half the care homes in the country. You know, do you think there's any chance that we might actually have done better had we done nothing at all? Yes, I think there's a, there's a chance we might have 
done better by doing nothing at all, or at least doing something different, which would have been to protect the vulnerable, to, to pay attention to protecting the vulnerable, to have thought about protecting the vulnerable 30, 40 years ago when we started cutting hospital beds. So the roots of this go a long, long way back. If we'd had a well-funded um, National Health Service, which had capacity for this sort of event, um, we, I think we would have done a lot better. You know, the other thing to say is that remaining in a state of lockdown is also one which I think is extremely dangerous from the point of view of the vulnerability, from the point of view of the vulnerability of the entire population to new pathogens. So effectively, I think we used to live in a state approximating lockdown a hundred years ago. And that was, I believe, what created the conditions for the Spanish flu to come in and kill 50 million people. And that is because what used to happen in that setting, the lockdown setting that we had with very little international travel, with not as many contacts uh, between people, low density populations, um, was one where a virus like the coronavirus would come in and sweep through and die out, which is what we're trying to get it to do. And what that meant is that every, if you take influenza, for example, it would come back every 30 years or so, rip through and disappear. But what that means is that every 30 years, there would be a sort of juicy fragment of the population under the age of 30 for the virus to attack. And that is exactly what we want to avoid. So actually, people being exposed more, being out, out and about more, is better for public health? I think so, yes. So this, the sort of follow-on question for, is there a chance things might have been better had we done nothing, is, is there a chance if we go back to normal tomorrow and say, right, lockdown is cancelled, reopen the pubs, reopen the nightclubs, everybody as you were, things might be fine. You know, is that a possibility? And how can we eliminate or prove that possibility? <laughs> well, I think it is a very strong possibility. But as you say, it's not something that one can easily prove. Um, obviously, the, the whole drive towards getting the zero um, epidemiological data was to provide that information on which one could hang such an argument, or if that proved to be wrong, to, to take alternative measures. But that is proving a little bit difficult. So while so that is a strong possibility. So what do we do? I think we weigh that strong possibility against the costs of lockdown. I think it's very dangerous to talk about lockdown without recognizing the enormous costs that it has on other vulnerable sectors in the population. So I know there's a sort of libertarian argument for the release of lockdown, and I think it's unfortunate that those of us who feel we should um, think differently about lockdown have had our voices added to that kind of libertarian harangue. But the truth is that lockdown is a luxury and it's a luxury that the middle classes are enjoying and um, higher income countries are enjoying at the expense of the poor, the vulnerable and um, the less developed countries. And I think it's a very serious crisis. And to think of it simply in terms of um, is this epidemic going to be over or not is, is really unconscionable. Thank you so much. Uh, for that, that was Professor Sunetra Gupta of the University of Oxford, who is Professor of Theoretical Epidemiology. Um, she was giving a very different uh, account of the way this pandemic might be uh, taking place. Um, and uh, certainly what she had to say should give our policymakers pause um, before making big decisions about continuing lockdown for indefinite periods. So thank you to her. And we'll be back in a couple of days time.